All right. Welcome back to another live broadcast of the Money Lab podcast from the Six Figure Academy. I am your host, Wei Hong from the Six Figure Academy. And this is the podcast where we give you tips, strategies, and interviews with other entrepreneurs on how to create that ultimate six-figure entrepreneur lifestyle free of bad money stories, money anxiety, and stress so that you can monetize your dreams and execute your genius. Now, if you haven't already downloaded our free ebook from Money Anxiety to Six Figure Mastery, make sure you go, go do that. It's at go.thesixfigureacademy.com. No, www. Just type in go.thesixfigureacademy.com. Had somebody ask about that earlier this past week. And then you can get it there. It's the perfect complement to all the things we discuss on this show. And quite frankly, we've been told it could change your life. Now, if you're just joining us live today and you are not on YouTube Live, uh, make sure you get on Spreaker.com or download the Spreaker app on your mobile device and search for the hashtag, hashtag, the money lab you got to put that hashtag there otherwise you can't find it for some reason so that you can join us in the chat room and ask questions to interact with us and our guests today and even request a specific topic to discuss that will help support you in your quest for the ideal six-figure lifestyle now while you're there subscribe so that you don't miss an episode and you can catch us every week for all other ways to find us go to the sixfigureacademy.com forward slash radio for all the details and now if there's something you love about what you hear on this episode today, and you know you that what you hear could absolutely help someone that you care about. Remember, sharing is caring. Share the show to that person so that they can totally benefit from what we're going to be talking about today. So now, the guest that I have on today has actually been um, a, a follower of our show, and I just learned prior to we started the show that he's been on since episode number three and we're on episode number 64 right now now episode number three we weren't even called the money lab back then it was called stop money anxiety now which is all about stopping money anxiety which is a lot of what we do still we just had started branching off and doing a lot more things so now it's called the money lab so it was kind of interesting hearing that and i was like wow now we finally have you on the show so basically let me give you a little bit of background about this amazing gentleman that i have on the show today um let me just start about talking about where he was coming from. I mean, at the by the at what drove him to kind of do what he does today. I mean, it all started when he was like at the age of seventeen, where his, uh, where you know his mom was diagnosed with fibromyalgia, and some of you may or most of us know somebody who's suffering and dealing with that. And so because of that, and this is a very similar to another story that I heard from one of our other guests as well, which is so cool. I mean, just it just shapes the individual so so fully in this lifetime. You know, he was inspired to help her and he started studying massage therapy to kind of kind of go that route of holistic healing. Now, afterwards, he helped create the first hospital based massage program in Wyoming. Four years later, he earned a master's degree from the Colorado School of Traditional Chinese Medicine. So now he's the founder of Artesian Spring Oriental Medicine, formal secretary of the Acupuncture Association of Colorado, was named Best Colorado Acupuncturist in 2015 and 2016, and he's been featured in Regenerate Magazine and Northern Colorado Medical and Wellness Magazine. He's also the host of his own podcast show that you gotta check out. It's called The Get Foxy Show. Now, basically, in on that show, he helps women get foxy, quote unquote. So ladies, listen up. He helps women get foxy through holistic, natural, aesthetic, cosmetic, facial acupuncture. Really, really cool. We get to talk a little bit about that today as well. But, you know, I mean, you might be wondering why it's called the Get Foxy Show, because this gentleman, I, my guest name today is Terry Fox. So welcome to the show, Terry. Finally, happy to get you on the air. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here, Way. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here and chat with you. I know. For those of you who are um, able to join us on YouTube Live, or if you haven't yet, jump on because you got to check out the very cool background. He's got very rustic, kind of like masterpiece theater. It's got that warm glow, unlike mine. It's a little bit more, uh, more clinical, more, more white. But like, if you look at his background, it's like warm. Makes you kind of want to take a nap, actually. <laughs> So anyway, yeah, welcome to the show. And, you know, just in, in in light of what we're talking about, before we jump into what you do, because I'm sure a lot of ladies who are listening to the show is what? Aesthetic, cosmetic acupuncture. And I'm sure, I mean, we're going to definitely dive into that. Let's talk a little bit about how you, you know, your journey that you went through. More importantly, because it's the money lab, we want to talk a little bit. Let's just get the money story out of the way. What? What is your money story? Because the title of today's show, which is is something that we kind of discussed before with another guest, but in your particular case, the the language is that you know uh, rich people are evil, right? 
Dun, dun, dun. Well, you know, luckily I've, I've kind of been working through this story over the years and that's rich people are evil. That's, that's not a truth anymore for me, but growing up, it, it really, it really was. Uh, where I grew up was a cattle ranch about 20 miles south of itty bitty little Buffalo, Wyoming. So really out in the middle of nowhere. So you're and, actually, a, you were born a cowboy. <laughs> uh, more or less. <laughs> I mean, if you put the hat on right now, the cowboy hat on now, you would totally pull it off. Oh, as yeah. A very dapper, I'll be a dapper <laughs> cowboy. Yeah, I've I've got the cowboy hats. I've got the Wranglers. I've got a belt buckle. I got my boots. Uh, you know, I can I can look the part, but you know, my dad did not want me or my brother to be cowboys for a living, and so he he highly discouraged us. But we still we my mom wanted us to learn some of the tricks of the trade. So because she married one, us how to saddle a horse and taught us how to ride and. Um, taught us while well, he tried to teach me how to rope, but <laughs> he got more frustrated than anything else. So I can rope on my feet. I can do okay. <clears throat> but if I'm on top of a horse, uh, don't, don't even, don't even go there. I'll, <laughs> You'll rope I'll, your own horse. <laughs> yes, I would. <laughs> I don't know what that so, is. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, the cowboy, lifestyle was something I I truly did grow up with and had had the opportunity to learn those kinds of things growing up in that rural area but as I said my old man was like don't do this he said I I love this work but the pay is horrible the work is 24 7 go to school Go find something that you want to do that you're passionate about that will pay the bills and be a hell of a lot easier than what I'm doing. Well, that sounds what, like a pretty good story so far, right? Yeah. Well, what he was doing was he was a hired hand helping manage this cattle ranch in northern Wyoming. There were, well, the, he grew up in that area. And the uh, fella that gave him the job, he had grown up with and gone gone to high school with. And the owner of the ranch was this fella's mother. So you had the rich mother and kind of the playboy son, if you will. And Playboy cowboy? Was he a playboy cowboy? You know, <laughs> I think he played at being cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> he he liked to do other things with his money and kind of impress people and show show off when and where he could. But uh, the the mother, I believe, really had her own money anxiety and bad money stories because she married into um, owning this ranch. It wasn't her ranch to begin with. She she married the man who owned it. Hmm. And she was extremely uh, a penny pincher, at least regarding a lot of the things with the working of the ranch. And so there were times where my dad would end up being pitted in between the mother wanting something done and done cheaply and the son wanting something done and ah, just go ahead and do whatever the heck you want. And don't mm. listen to the old lady. Do you you listen to me because the old lady's going to be dying soon. <laughs> so <laughs> my my dad ended up, you know, really despising this situation, or at least that was my perception as a kid. Right. And what I picked up was that my dad was stuck in this position between these two rich people who were not respectful of him and didn't seem to value him but they were the ones with the money and he needed to earn the money to keep his family fed 
Mm -hmm. So where did the language where like, you know, the association with rich people being evil or or being, you know, bad or anything like that, did that come up just from observation or did it, did yeah. someone actually say something? Well, you know, evil might be a little too extreme in that regard, but uh, mm -hmm. at the same time, for, for the sake of language, uh, evil seems to be at least a little, a little bit better than just calling them assholes. <laughs> <laughs> no. Right. So, but that was the kind of language, uh, you know, a little bit saltier cowboy style language that um, I'd grown up with. Right. And, and so, did that come out of your parents' mouth or did that, did that come up from your observation in terms of you decided as a child say, OK, that's the name I'm going to. That's how that's the, that's a language I'm going to associate with my dad's bosses. I can say that uh, a little from column A, a little from column B. OK. I mean, I feel like I was pretty perceptive as a kid mm -hmm. at, at that time. But yeah, I, I, well, actually, I had a conversation with my dad, I don't know, a couple months ago, where he still used that language. <laughs> to describe his current situation? <laughs> yeah, well, to describe rich people in general. Wow. And so, you know, I've, I've had a conversation with my dad about that. And I'm like, okay, well, that's not an opinion I've, I've, I've had to kind of work through, and I don't hold that anymore. I said, but that's definitely something that I learned from you, Dad. And he said, well, it's a truth, ain't it? <laughs> and I said, well. So what happens you know, if I get rich, Dad? Yeah, well, <laughs> that was exactly it. As I said, are you going to call me an a-hole son now? <laughs> <laughs> and he wasn't. It, it didn't quite comprehend or, or make sense to him uh, in that regard yeah. because it was like, oh, um, well, no, no, not you because – and then it was – it just didn't quite – It started to challenge sense. his yeah. grip on reality. Yeah. He lived with that reality for so long and all of a sudden you just threw a monkey wrench in it. It's like, well, dad, what <laughs> if, do you not want your son to get rich? And if he's rich, do you just end up, does he fall into that category now? <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, and I think that was huge for me growing up mm -hmm. because, yeah, I don't want to be like these ranch owners that my dad had to work with. Mm -hmm. And I went, I went back as I was working through this and there was mm -hmm. one incident that really stuck out to me. And it was this um, this incident where around Christmas time, the old lady would give a bonus to the ranch hands. And I think my dad was really banking on that bonus that year. I don't know why, hmm. but for some reason, he was really banking on that bonus. And when time came around to receive the bonus... What he brought home was a box of Isotoner driving gloves. I used to like those gloves, by the way. They <laughs> they're were really, really comfortable. Nice gloves. I know, they're nice gloves. <laughs> uh, not exactly a cash bonus, I'm sure, but... No, and, uh, you know, when you're, when you're a ranch hand driving an old nasty Ford pickup, what the hell do you need driving gloves for? you've got you've got your gloves you've got your work gloves you're out there working fence throwing hey you know doctor and cows getting in the cow crap in the dirt you don't need fancy isotoner driving gloves so of course the the implications of this were she doesn't know me she doesn't value me and so my dad was hot man i mean just flat angry and i remember a really heated conversation that he was having with my mother and they were going back and forth and i mean he was threatening to quit his job because this lady had just thoroughly insulted him and then of course left him in a position that he felt that you know he was banking on that christmas bonus sure and now now we're stuck and so watching all that and observing it 
I mean, I, I really took it in as, wow. Yeah, man, rich people are evil. Mm. If, if, they, if they're going to leave my dad in a lurch like that right. and then give him something that he can't use. Right. What was he banking on? What was he? What was he? <laughs> Honestly, I, I couldn't tell you. I'm not sure what our financial situation was mm -hmm. at that time. This was probably, I'll bet I was seven, right? maybe eight years old at the time. So of course, uh, I knew we, we didn't have a whole lot of money. Right. Um, I remember standing in line at the senior center um, with my mom. And they were handing out government commodities, the government cheese, the rice, all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. I remember my mom paying at the grocery store with food stamps. So, yeah, my, my folks were not uh, financially secure. Mm -hmm. But um, I have no idea exactly what my dad was banking on then. I mean, it could have been, it could have been Christmas gifts for us kids. I have no idea. Right. But it was something important to him right wow and so how do you think that those circ those events and those uh those learnings or those belief systems that were hammering in around the money piece associating with rich people and everything like that how did that then show up for you personally in your own journey in life in terms of work and money like you said you you were going through a few you you you, were, you had to work through a lot of this you know growing mm -hmm. up to actually get to where you are today well, first off, it, it showed up that, uh, okay, well, all I can do is work for a living because I can't be an entrepreneur because if you own a business or you own a ranch, well, then you've just become an owner. And of course, that means you're, you're an evil. Evil. So <laughs> no, I don't want to, I don't want to be that. Okay. So that means I have to go to work for somebody. I have to, I have to get a job. And then, of course, when you get the job, you're like, okay, well, yeah, I got to gotta do enough to start earning money because I need the money. But there you again, can't make, oh, you can't make I, too much money either, exactly. right? Exactly. No, I don't. Okay. I can't make that much money because, you know, then, of course, I'll be perceived as rich. And then if I'm perceived as rich, well, then, yeah, I am rich. And Oh, no. And, and was that an actual, I mean, because a lot of that stuff often runs unconscious, but did you find yourself having that dialogue consciously throughout the throughout your journey in your career and you're working all these different types of um, jobs that you were doing? You know, it really didn't dawn on me until after I got married mm -hmm. and I'd been in my practice for um, six, seven years. Probably about, yeah, probably about six. Mm -hmm. And I kept thinking, why, why am I not more successful with this? Because I'm a hell of a good acupuncturist. I'm a damn good practitioner. Why is my practice not flourishing? Because I was told in acupuncture school that if you're a good enough practitioner and you help people, well, people will, will tell people and they'll just come and your practice will build naturally. <laughs> <laughs> Right. That's, that is definitely not the case. It's it's a piece, but that's not the case. So I ended up, uh, I got to thank a couple of people. One is Brendan Burchard. Uh -huh. And I don't know if you're familiar with Brendan Burchard or not. Yep. But uh, he, he had written this book called The Millionaire Messenger. <clears throat> and somebody handed me a copy of it and I got to thumbing through it and then started following Brendan and man, what he was saying all of a sudden resonated with me and it started making sense. And so I started looking more into personal, the growth, personal growth, personal development, and came across Harv Ecker's book, the uh, millionaire mindset mindset and ended up going to one of those uh, millionaire mindset weekend seminars that they put on. And man, I had such an epiphany there about rich people and that, oh my gosh, no money, money is not evil and having money is not evil. Money is simply energy and energy is an amplifier 
And so, you know, if you're a good person and you have money, all that money does is it gives you more opportunity to do good. Right. If you're an a-hole, uh, then money just makes you a bigger one. Right. <laughs> it, right. it amplifies that. <clears throat> so I came home from, from uh, that weekend and my wife was like, what cult did you just join? Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> your attitudes have changed so much. And I said, yeah, I, I guess so. <laughs> but for years, this was all, I mean, it was all running subconsciously. It, wow. It really so it wasn't crazy. until like several years ago, just a few, several years ago that you really had a shift. So you lived with this belief system for most of your life. Yes. Wow. And in yeah. look and looking back, uh, you know, if just kind of seeing what you went through and the different different jobs that you've done, um, what where what do you see that 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 belief system how it has impacted your um, the decisions you made in the work or the money you made that you made during the, mm -hmm. in, in all those jobs? I mean, looking back now that you can look back and see <laughs> how that showed up. I mean, for you. I mean, you probably kind of done that already, but what, how did, how do you think that really impacted like your career, even not even as an entrepreneur, but in other jobs and stuff like that? Well, I can tell you, <laughs> um, while I was in college during, during my summers, I would work for the, the city, my, my hometown's city department. And I took care of the parks. I took care of cleaning the public restrooms in the parks and, would help out on the garbage truck if they needed somebody, uh, helped out on the road crew if they needed somebody. But my mother kept telling me, you got to find, you got to find different work. Said, you can't, you can't do this all your life. And I was thinking, I'm making $12 an hour. This is pretty good. I, I could do this the rest of my life. Wow. Yeah, and <laughs> now I look back and I go, whoa, what? <laughs> Dodge that bullet. Because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, geez. Wait, that wait, not the Money Lab show. You'd be on the $12 per hour show. It's like, hey, let's look at all these people who are making $12 an hour. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was 18 at the time, so, you know, I'm 41 now. I can't even imagine what my life would be like if I'd have stuck with working at the city. I'd probably be like a, a senior manager now there maybe. Right. But, oh man. Wow. So I'm, I'm glad that uh, I'm, I'm out of that. But yeah, that mindset really kind of kept me there. And I was, I was happy mm -hmm. to be in that position. So... Now now you mentioned happy and and there's a lot of there's a school of thought out there that says you know if if money isn't the biggest deal or whatever the case may be and you, if you're happy doing what you're doing there probably isn't anything wrong right so how did you then distinguish how did you then realize that that happiness wasn't happiness or was that happiness the happiness that you know that that you would equate to or define as happiness today I think one, my definition has changed as I've grown, as I've gotten older and learned more, uh, that definition's broadened, but at the time it was, it was just, okay, well, I'm, I'm happy because I'm doing exactly like my old man. I've gotten a job, it's stable and there's income coming in. So that and was so, how you define happiness back then. Yeah. Yeah, I had, I had a place to live. I had a little money for beer, and <laughs> life all was good. good. I mean, I, is... I I got furniture from the, uh, the from the city dump because people would you know throw away furniture. Well, hey, that furniture is still good, man. I had this sweet orange, like Hunter Blaze orange, crushed velvet, um, like Lazy Boy style chair. Uh -huh. that somebody had thrown out at the dump and it even, it even had a vibrating massager in it. <laughs> and I brought that back to my folks place and I said, I, I need you, mom, I need you to hang on to this chair for me. So when I get my apartment, I can have this chair. And she said, Oh, really? 
And come, I come to find out later on in life, she was looking at that chair going, this boy is never going to get a girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> he is never going to get married. Because he's home this out. kind of furniture from the dump. <laughs> <laughs> so so at what point did you realize that i mean because it sounds like you were living the definition at the time you were defining happiness as was defined by circumstances society your parents people around you and everything like that at what point did you realize that that happiness wasn't exactly what what you thought it was going to be or what true happiness for you uniquely be you know i think it's it's been kind of an evolution over the years, I don't know if there's been just one specific turning point where it was just like, oh, the light bulb came on. But over the years, I mean, I've, I'm a big fan of learning and, and just learning all sorts of different kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. And once I started reading Brendan Burchard and Harv Eker, then it started morphing into, okay, well, let's learn a little bit more about personal development. Let's, oh, well, okay, these ideas that these guys are teaching, this is a little bit different than what I grew up with. Huh. Well, let's let's see what how that works. And so I would put some of these <coughs> ideas into practice, which would then lead me to other authors, other speakers, other coaches, other trainers, uh, really until uh, here we are right now when I when I came across the uh, Stop Money Now, Now the Money Lab podcast. Right. Very cool. So it's, it's just been a progression. Yeah. So it wasn't like any one specific moment. It was just kind of a, like a, a, a slow evolutionary cycle. So that... yeah, the frog boiling in the pot kind of thing. <laughs> Except like think, in the in a positive direction. Yeah. I was like going, did the frog die in that scenario? Like, are you the water or are you the frog? <laughs> okay, so so I want but there was a point though that you decided, you know what, I am going to be an entrepreneur, you know, because you were doing all these different jobs, right? So name just rattle off some of the jobs that you've done. I mean, I know you and I shared the DJ job on a radio station. We both did that before, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, what, what's another, what's a few other jobs that you've done in your journey until you be tiny to finally decided to become an entrepreneur? Okay. Well, my first job was, uh, actually helping out a local carpenter, uh, repair roofs on houses. Hmm. And then from there, of course, I did a lot of ranch work, either helping my dad or, uh, I lived with my grandfather who was also a rancher and I worked with him. Uh, I also contracted with him building uh, fences and also uh, contracted with him spraying weeds um, along a local line of ditches. <coughs> Let's see. I worked in college as a waiter and a busboy. Uh, I was so terrible at waiting, they they actually told me to go back to being a busboy. <laughs> what made you so terrible at waiting? Oh, I was awful. I uh, Well, I couldn't remember the menu. And then... Uh, I guess that's kind of important. Living in a tourist town in Wyoming, there would be these buses that would come through, these tourist buses that would have, you know, 50 people on it or better. And we're in this little restaurant, so of course we'd just get slammed. Mm. And... I don't do well with multitasking quickly. It just is not one of my God-given talents. You know, the shift gears. Yeah. And all of a sudden you got an onslaught of people coming in, right? <laughs> yeah. Couldn't, couldn't do it. I, I do very well one-on-one -on -one with people, but uh, having to serve multiple people very quickly, I would forget orders. I would drop stuff. It, it just, they, they were justified in in <laughs> sending me back to being a bus boy <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i also worked for, for for the city um i worked as a radio dj on the weekends uh later on i ended up getting a job as a um 
a, a hand who helped build log homes and we would literally take logs and drill holes in them and then i was i was kind of the grunt they uh they gave me a, a 10 pound sledgehammer and then i was driving 14 inch helix spikes through these holes to nail these logs together and we so would put like together log homes the literally log the, the log cabin that we would build as a plastic model as kids but you were actually building in real life <laughs> yeah yeah it was it was kind of neat to do and uh it, it definitely kept me in shape i mean i had biceps I, I was pretty proud of my biceps that time but <laughs> you're yeah. constantly lifting stuff. Did you, you did pavement too right you laid pavement yeah that was part of the part of the city work okay and then uh, eventually i got into college i uh worked at the college writing center helping other people write their papers because english and writing really came easily to me oh yeah and Wasn't that then, your major then as well? Yes, I did major. I started out as a physical therapy major because I thought, well, physical therapy, massage therapy, it's kind of the same gig. Mm -hmm. But uh, my PT um, advisor said, no, man, you need a you need a 4.0 so that you can get into a good PT school. And I'm 18, 19 years old away from home for the first time. I'm ready to drink beer and party. Yeah, so I knew, yeah. I knew. I'm like, there's no way I'm getting a 4 -0. But I went to class as hungover as I could be. It, it didn't matter. I still went to class. So I pulled a 375. Right. But uh, I didn't like my advisor harping on me. So I switched to English. And so I did get my associate's degree in English. And then I went, what in the hell am I going to do with an English degree? I can, I can teach or I can Speak write, English. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So that's when I started looking at massage therapy pretty seriously. Mm -hmm. And then that led me to massage therapy school. And when I got out of massage therapy school, then it was like all of a sudden, okay, I guess I'm a business owner now. Oh, I'm, I'm working for myself now. Um, because there weren't any massage therapy businesses in my hometown because I went back to my hometown uh -huh. and I became an independent contractor with a local uh, dude ranch. <coughs> and so that was kind of interesting because then all of a sudden I learned a dude ranch. A dude ranch? Uh, some people, the I guess the more politically correct term is guest ranch. And so it's a, it's a working cattle ranch, but they invite guests from all over the world really to have a cowboy experience oh. and you get to help them work the cows you get to go out and have a campfire and sing cowboy songs or you can go fishing or you can go trail riding and they call it dude ranch because it becomes like like the big lebowski it's the dude everybody <laughs> that comes in it's the dude well it's it's kind of an old cowboy term for somebody who who wants to be a cowboy but really isn't a cowboy so a dude is a want to be cowboy basically. Uh -huh. <laughs> so if all of my friends I say, "Hey, what's up dude?" It's like I basically have been saying this whole time, "What's up, want to be cowboy?" Well, in California, it's got a completely different context, but <laughs> or a connotation. Yeah, but, dude. Yeah, where I grew up, it was like, "Okay, those are you could tell those folks are dudes because they they have a different accent. They've got like this East Coast accent. City They've slickers. Big uh, they went and bought the big cowboy boots with the bright colors, and they've went and tucked their pant legs inside the cowboy boots. Where the real the real cowboys they don't tuck their pants in their cowboy boots. That's won't the rocks get in that way? <laughs> <laughs> That's how rocks get in your boots, right? Because you tuck everything in there. <laughs> yeah. So we were able to pick them out, but that's we say, oh yeah, there's there's the dudes right there. But um, yeah, I worked I worked there for a summer and got to learn that I knew nothing about running a business because I ended up having to pay self-employment tax and really got myself uh, in a little bit of a pickle because mm -hmm. I was just getting the paychecks and then spending all the money. Oh, so you didn't have, you didn't put money aside to pay taxes. No, not at all. Because I, uh, I thought, well, I'm, I'm employed by them. And they said, no, you're not employed by us. You are an independent contractor. Oh, Okay, so that was my first kind of hard lesson in being an entrepreneur.
Yeah, I think a lot of people actually have gone through that journey um, because they don't teach us these things in school. And until unless you have a mentor that has found you or or you've actually have parents that are, um, you know, they're they're entrepreneurs as well. Nobody's going to teach you those, you know, those little tiny fundamental nuances. Right. Yep. But there's something very powerful about learning it on your own because you're it's like a paid lesson. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My needless to say, my dad wasn't too happy with me because he he was the one that had to bail me out. Right. But uh from there I ended up moving from my hometown, Buffalo, Wyoming, to Laramie. And that was where I kind of got my first exposure to acupuncture because I moved my office space in with with another acupuncturist. Mm -hmm. And I watched him work. And uh, he wasn't mo the most ethical fella. So eventually <laughs> I needed to get out of there. Um, and lo and behold, they were starting a massage therapy program at the hospital there. And so I applied. I was the very first massage therapist they hired. And then, of course, they wanted a lot of feedback from me as to how to develop the program. And we had a pretty good program there for about four years. Mm hmm and then eventually priorities changed, the administration changed, and they said, well, you guys aren't making enough money, and they canned the program. Mm. But uh, I had some experiences there in the hospital using acupressure on patients that, man, I thought, oh, if, if I knew how to do this like an acupuncturist, these people might not even be in here. Mm. And so that was, that was kind of the first idea where I went, yeah, I, I need to go learn acupuncture. So, so it was basically your interests that kind of corralled you to use the use the terms that are relevant to you, uh, corralled you into the world of entrepreneurship. It's almost as if like, okay, now I'm trained as a massage. So I have almost like no choice but to be an entrepreneur, if you will. Yeah, I, I could have gone to work for a spa, but from what I'd heard of the spas, they, they work you till you burn out. And the average massage therapist, when they're doing that kind of work, burns out within five years. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's not going to be me. If I'm going to be doing this work, I'm going to be doing this work for a lifetime. Which meant, yeah, I had to be doing it for myself. And when I got out of acupuncture school, same thing. There's, you could be hired by a spa, maybe. But then that would mean I'd have to, I'd have to move to well god forbid california <laughs> hey what's wrong with california <laughs> i i like it right here in the rocky mountains way i am i am a rocky mountain kid so yeah colorado wyoming montana i'm i'm pretty happy with can't maybe. take the cowboy out of the cowboy <laughs> no matter what he does for a living <laughs> cowboy acupuncture i think that's what it should be called now <laughs> well i did have some uh classmates in acupuncture school call me a kung fu cowboy <laughs> <laughs> it's like okay, I'm, all right. So we'll do a we'll we'll have to do a country rendition of uh, a kung fu fighting, but we'll do like country <laughs> style with a country twang to it, right? <laughs> so so you know, so this is an interesting thing because what happened? It, it sounds like it wasn't. It, it it was almost like you didn't. You never really kind of had a moment where it says, "I'm going to be an entrepreneur." At what point did it hit you? It's like, holy cow, I'm an entrepreneur. And that money story started to kind of like reveal itself again. I mean, the money flow was, I mean, was it, was it up and down? Was it consistent? I mean, throughout your whole journey, after you stepped into the world of entrepreneurship, how was the flow of money in terms of making income and making revenue? Was it consistently growing or was it just kind of haphazard and all over the place? For the most part, I always earned enough money to keep the business afloat, but not really enough money to bring home on a consistent regular basis okay so it's just enough to support just enough to keep keep the doors open right because what would happen if you made more you know what would have happened if i'd have made more i probably would have spent it <laughs> do you think that was the money story running is running, running <laughs> its, uh, its, its uh its pattern it's a good bet it's a good bet. Um, again, that's something I'm still kind of working on and, and re-engineering. Mm -hmm. But um, 
Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me in the least. And I think, I mean, thinking back as as a child, I was always the one, once I had money, whether it was given to me by my grandmother or for my birthday or, you know, I found some or something. Right. I was, I was like, oh, heck yeah, spend it. Where did you learn that though? Where'd you pick that up from? Because I have something? no idea. I'm not exactly sure where, where I got that. But my younger brother was a saver, mm. almost to the point of hoarding. <laughs> Just another of <laughs> and so, I mean, he, he was a miser. I mean, he would hang on to it and hang on to it. And I'd be like, dude, don't you want, look what I got. Don't you want one of these? Oh, no, man. No, no. And then, you know, several months later, he would decide, okay, I'm going to spend on something. And then he'd get something just flabbergastingly amazing. How did you do that? Well, I didn't spend money on the crap you spent. <laughs> but did he end up spending it all or he just spent some of it? He would spend some. Okay. He was, he was, and still is a pretty, pretty thrifty guy. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's interesting because, you know, uh, and I, I think a lot of entrepreneurs are actually on the same boat where they, they've structured their business so that they make just enough to keep the, continue to keep the doors open, but it's, uh, you know, nothing to run home to, you know, um, to, to your parents about and say, look, look at me. I've, I, I, I netted a million dollars this year or something like that. Right. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, and I, I thought and, you folks would fall over if I had something like that. <laughs> I know. There's an evil. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I wonder, I, you know, I often wonder what that is that drives that. It's just like, because I think it's, um, do you think it was because it's something that you can actually wrap your head around? Like, okay, this bill needs to be pay, paid. This bill needs to be paid. Paying my future self or putting money towards something bigger and stuff like that. It's so nebulous and can't find it. Then, uh okay well i guess we'll put some money into that but i know this bill needs to be paid i know that do you think it's something like that or is it just because of something else well that could be that could definitely be the nebulousness of it certainly plays in mm -hmm. um there again you know becoming an entrepreneur essentially on my own with without anybody to say yeah this is how you run a business mm -hmm. huh okay well yeah i've got these bills in front of me and that's you know if, if it's in front of me i see it okay then it's top of mind as soon as it's out here away from me out of my direct line of vision out of sight out of mind man right and so that that can that can definitely bite you in the butt yeah. And I, and I think what happens is a lot of people don't spend enough time getting clear on where they want to go. And that's why it's difficult to put money towards something bigger, right? Or to put bring money in to put something towards something. Yes. Bigger, right. It's interesting because, you know, just hearing your story, it's like, wow, I think a lot of people are in that kind of same kind of boat. They, they make just enough to keep the business open. So it just in a way, it's find a way to justify that I'm in business, right? Oh, I can pay my staff. I can feed these people and stuff like that. And then they look at the income that they actually bring in. It's like, I don't know. Is this worth it? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. Now, look, now you went into acupuncture and then um, did, and then you niched out to this specific niche of cosmetic or aesthetic uh, acupuncture to help people holistically, you know, you know, look better, right? Uh, in a healthy way without doing cutting or um, uh, what do you call uh, Botox, Botox, which is botulism. For those of you who don't know what Botox actually is, I finally looked it up years ago and I said, wait a minute, did I read, did I read that right? They're injecting botulism. If, if, for those of you who don't know what botulism is, it's what happens when you have a bad can of food that goes really bad and you open it up and eat it and you actually get sick and maybe even die from it. Now, Botox is you're actually taking that and injecting it into your skin or different parts of your body. Yep, you right. inject it into the musculature and it paralyzes the muscles. So it's they don't work. Toxin. Yep. Now, what happens when you do this for a long time? You, does the muscle stop working altogether? You know, they haven't done a whole lot of studies out there to see 
what the long-term effects are because this is still a relatively new treatment. <coughs> Who decided that? That that let's put some toxin in someone and see what happens. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure, I mean, but uh, like, I do know that over time, that if these muscles aren't moving, that yes, they can atrophy. Right. They they will get smaller. They will get weaker. Right. Um. The interesting thing about putting Botox in your face is that there are studies that have been done that show that when you engage, like for example, the muscles in between your eyebrows that make you clench your eyebrows. You mean you like do that this? frowny face? Yes. Those muscles, when they engage, help you feel anger, irritation, frustration. Mm. And so they've been finding that if they put Botox in these muscles, people are less apt to feel anger, irritation, and frustration. So they're saying, oh, well, Botox is helping you cure your depression. Oh, God. Well, no, what it's actually doing is it's just deadening you to those specific emotions. It's, it's it basically, it's interrupting a sequence of steps that is part of the totality of expressing anger. Yes. Right. And there's even a psychological connection here where when you can't express yourself, it's harder to read the expressions of other people. And so, oh. and th that was an interesting study that I'd read is that people who have had Botox have a harder time reading other people's emotions on their faces. So not only did they become emotionless themselves, they just become a little bit numb to the people around them too. Yes. Wow. Holy cow. So so you basically I mean obviously you've delved into this whole area. So tell me tell, what exactly is this niche of the of a cosmetic aesthetic acupuncture? <laughs> I mean what what is it what is it specifically geared towards? What is it supposed to do? What it's specifically geared towards is helping the body stay healthy. That's the main part of traditional Chinese medicine in general with acupuncture, herbal medicine, these kinds of um, things. We're working to help the body function optimally. Hmm. So now, when you see physical degradation, then that's, a, that's an indicator then of the body not operating at its optimal yes, space. Yes, uh, you bet. So with the aesthetic work that I do, it's essentially a natural aesthetic enhancement system that's based in traditional Chinese medicine. It's not just acupuncture. Although I use acupuncture, it's also based in Chinese herbal medicine. Mm -hmm. I also use massage therapy. I use internal herbal medicine. I also do a little bit of dietary coaching. We also talk about um, qigong and energy enhancing exercise. It's it's all holistic wellness. So it's basically getting your whole entire body back into sync in a natural way so that it can actually basically saying that the reason why you're having some physical degradation is because your body is not optimally tuned. Yes, that is definitely a big part of it. Uh -huh. And so we do that tuning. And then when it comes to the facial work specifically, although we can also, I've got training in breast work, abdominal work, and buttock work. Uh, <laughs> but most, most folks are just wanting their faces worked on. Every line on the face tells a story. In, in traditional Chinese medicine face reading, each line we say is put on the face because you are experiencing some type of chronic emotion. So for example, again, we talk about these lines kind of in between the eyebrows mm -hmm. when you're constantly frowning, right. when you're constantly irritated, angry, upset, or in my case, I do a lot of focus, I have a lot of focusing where I've I'm really intense and my eyebrows clench together. Well, right. every time those eyebrows clench together, it creates and deepens that line. It starts out in the muscle and then eventually will write itself on the skin. Right. And then depending on 
whether the line is in the skin or in the muscle, I do different needling techniques to help uh, the skin release that line and help the muscles rebalance and reset using uh, needling the neuromuscular junctions to get those muscles to re kind of reset the way that they sit on the face so that they're balanced and they're, they're no longer in a state of tension or hyper relaxation. Oh, so it's kind of like when you like uh, roll your ankle and then you, 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 you kind of hobble around and you develop this limp, but you've been limping for so long that the body adapts and adjusts because the body's an amazing machine and the muscles compensate and now you've got this limp or you've you've got some kind of a weird contortion in your body as a result of healing from that you know that um rolled ankle and then it's stuck kind of in a particular configuration yes yep that's very similar yeah and so what you what you do then is you release that so you like you said like you reset it so oh by the way body remember this and then that way, it brings you back to more accurately represent where you are now in life, your age, whatever the case Yes, is. yes. And so when you come out of this, you still look like you, your, your natural looking self. And you don't come out like, who are you? What happened? <laughs> exactly. I mean, when people get Botox, when people get plastic surgery, they can't lie about it. I mean, we all see it. It's there. People see the procedure that you had, right. but when you, when you go through this kind of work, people, they don't see the procedure. They only see the person in front of them. Right. And so you, they'll say, okay, well, you look really good. What did you get a haircut? Well, not you way. You, <laughs> I did Yeah, just the other day. <laughs> but they'll say, yeah. Did you get a haircut? Did you lose weight? Are you working out? What are you doing? Right. Because you just look so vibrant, vibrant. And there's a glow and everything like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and and you know, in the work that I do on and one of my other companies is about you know with the with the human assessment piece. I mean, this explains why a lot of people. We explain why a lot of people have to get massive plastic surgery done that their life the life becomes more tumultuous, more more dramatic because now they're attracting people that shouldn't be attracting you know, naturally to their physical representation, right? Or vice versa, or they're looking at themselves in the mirror and they're seeing themselves, but it's not how they were born. And they're just kind of like, it's like, it's like you're fooling yourself internally to be a certain way that you weren't designed to be. Yeah, I hadn't considered that, but yeah, that is so spot on. Right. And that's why you hear a lot, you know, why is it that people who have massive amounts of plastic surgery and they have all this drama in their life as a result of that, you know, and they say, well, it's because I'm more attractive. Now, no, you're just attracting people that you shouldn't be attracting that aren't a fit, that aren't a match. Right. So I love what it is that you do is like you optimize how they look. And when they come out, they don't look completely different. They just look better than what how they looked before, which is more optimal to how they naturally show up. Yes, that is exactly it. We're looking at, you know, I can't say we turn back the clock. We don't, we, we can't stop the clock mm -hmm. when it comes to aging, plain and simple. We are always headed towards the cliff and eventually we are going to fall off that cliff. You mean die? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, what cliff are you talking about? <laughs> you know, people like cliff diving and they'll just like going, well, I cliff dive all the time. I come off the cliff. What are you talking about? <laughs> the question is, do you want to, you know, just uh, fall off the cliff or would you rather dance off, you know? So I, I, I help people and we, we dance together. <laughs> you dance with your clients? Oh, that's kind of cool. <laughs> you guys get together and dance and say, okay, I'm going to work on your, uh, your internal health, work on your mindset, work on your skin, do your nerves and everything like that. And then we'll dance. And then we tango. And, then <laughs> and you have the tango music in fact. Dun, 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 dun. And then you pull out the fake rose because, you know, if you oh, keep my rose, goodness. Anyway, I'm, I'm so, <laughs> sending a whole new marketing campaign happening here away. I know totally work. It's like those purple <laughs> commercials, you know, or like, uh, the, 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 what do you call the, the squatty potty commercials, you know, the <laughs> but anyway, um, 
So there's so much more I want to ask because like, like, for example, I, I want to know how you decided to blend this all together and how you figured it out. But um, we've actually run out of time. We only have five minutes left. And I want to make sure I give people an opportunity for those especially that are interested in what it is that you do and how you do it to be able to connect with you on some level. I mean, I know you're in Colorado and may not be able to um, serve the entire world that are that's able to access this um, this show. But you know, at least maybe they can find um, consult with you or talk to you about certain things that they can do. And I think you you may even be able to do some virtual things with them to kind of help them out. So how do how do people get a hold of you if they're interested in learning more about not maybe your journey or but really importantly about the cosmetic and aesthetic uh, aspect of how you help people optimize their health? You bet. Well, there's there's several ways that they can interact with me. One, they can go to my website, which is www.artesianspring O for Oriental, M for medicine. So it's artesianspringom.com. Um, they can find me on Facebook. Uh, I am happy to answer traditional Chinese medicine questions, questions regarding aesthetic acupuncture. They can feel free to give me a call. 970-633-0199 and i'd be happy to answer questions for you know 970-663 i'm typing it in 970-633-0199 uh-huh. and yeah i if you need help finding a practitioner in your area i'm happy to do that shoot me an email give me a call my email is terry at artesianspringom.com another way you can interact with me is my own podcast uh, the get foxy show oh we didn't even talk about that oh my (laughs) bad you can find that on uh, google play i uh apple Podcasts, spotify stitcher tune in or you can just go to the get foxy show.com i actually just released my 31st episode earlier this morning I had uh, a wonderful comedian on. We talk about holistic health, natural beauty, and passionate living. So it's it's a fun way to uh, learn a little bit about me, but also these amazing guests that I have on. And Way, we've definitely got to have you on the show uh, sometime in the near future as well. Yeah, that'd be fun. I, I don't I don't mind getting a little foxy. <laughs> yeah, how, how can I get foxy? <laughs> I love the name so stuff like that. And I love the fact that there's a there's a fox behind you whenever I talk to you on the video and stuff like that. So it's kind of a cool thing. So awesome. So you know, th- again, th- thank you so much for being on the show. And I put I posted all those different links and everything in the Spreaker chat uh, screen. So for those of you who want to kind of reach out, make sure you go to the our Spreaker. Um, uh, show space and you can look in the comments and everything and all the links are there. Definitely reach out and connect with this guy because, you know, he's, he's got a big, huge heart. I love working with him and, and, and I love the fact that he's constantly in this place of wanting to grow and evolve his way, not just to make money, but also to be able to help people understand that it's beyond just looking good. It's also all about looking good on the inside and out, right? Health is beauty. Yep. Health is beauty. The true beauty, right? Not just the surface beauty. Amen to that. (laughs) Awesome. Very, very cool. So basically, uh, that's our show for the week. We only have a couple minutes left. But again, if you found this episode to be valuable, and, and some of the things that I want to kind of highlight is the fact that, you know, sometimes you just kind of fall into entrepreneurship. Uh, despite your your money challenge, your money story, but then where it shows up is in, inside those moments where you say, like, oh my God, now I'm an entrepreneur, but I'm like making all these mistakes or I'm not making the money that I want. So, you know, kind of kind of go back to this episode and kind of listen to those things and those areas where you say, oh, I'm just making enough money to keep my doors open. How then do I shift to do that? And if you join us in the Facebook group, um, and in fact, if you didn't know we had a Facebook group called The Money Lab, we do have that. Uh, Terry is actually uh, pretty active in that group as well, right? You're in, you're in our. You bet. Yep. So you can connect with them there as well. So if you can't find him for whatever reason, after all those links I put on, you can always find him at the Money Lab 
uh, Facebook group as well. So share this with someone that you think would benefit from this, someone who wants to look better, feel better, uh, someone who's local to the Colorado area, or maybe even beyond, because I'm pretty sure that there's a lot of things that he can do beyond just because you know, you could also advise them on the medicines. You could advise them on lifestyle things and everything like that, right? Yeah. Okay, great. So find us out. And if you want to review us on iTunes, Spreaker, or like the episode on Google Live. And uh, like I said, join us in the Facebook group so that we could dive even deeper into conversation with people like Terry and all these other amazing people that are on the show. So uh, that is pretty much it. That's a wrap. So take this week. Uh, to apply the knowledge from today, have an amazing week, and we will catch you next week on the Money Lab Live podcast where we have Dr. Rodney Ruge talking about if you build it, money will come, the lie behind that, so you don't want to miss that. So this is Way and Terry from the Six Figure Academy signing off. All right, we can say goodbye on the uh, YouTube channel. See you, YouTube land. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. <laughs>